today we get to enter what you might call volume two of the book of Ephesians, the second half of it, beginning with chapter four, uh, passing through the white space in your Bible between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4 is sort of like graduating from school into real life. It's graduation from theory into practice, from foundation to the building, from the drawing board to the groundbreaking ceremony. People have come up with vivid ways to describe it. They say Longfellow could take a worthless sheet of paper, write a poem on it, and make it worth thousands of dollars. Well, that's genius. Rockefeller can sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth millions. That's capital. Uncle Sam can take paper, stamp an eagle on it, and make it worth $100. That's, that's money. A mechanic, skilled mechanic, can take material worth $5 and make a gadget worth $50. That's skill. An artist can take a piece of canvas, paint a picture on it, and make it maybe worth thousands, and that's art. But God can take a sinful life, wash it in the blood of Christ, put His Spirit in it, and make it a blessing to humanity and get Himself glory for eternity. That is salvation. When we come to uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, we're going to start to see what to do in light of what we've seen in three chapters. Remember that two-word theme of Ephesians, in Christ, occurs 27 times? Well, now we're going to talk about what to do because we are in Christ. And as we enter chapter 4, the, the first 16 verses have a theme that tie them together. The theme is unity in this sermon and the next time we come to Ephesians and we finish the rest of the sentence that is in the first three verses, we're going to see the ingredients of unity. Then verses 4 through 6 is the theology of unity, followed by the diversity that comprises our unity, followed by the functioning of our unity as we interact with each other, and then the fruits of our unity in verses 13 through 16. Now, you need to understand that this spiritual unity that we have in Christ is not something we create. It's not something mechanical. It's not something external. It is internal. It is supernatural. You cannot superimpose spiritual unity on people apart from the life of Christ. It comes from the power of Christ indwelling each believer. It is a, a spirit-controlled, spirit-produced unity which is rooted in, in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are part of this unity. Now, unity is a very popular word, but there are some very wrong ideas attached to it. Uh, to, to many Christians, the idea of unity is primarily just maintaining the status quo. We say we have unity as long as we always do everything the way we've done it and no one is offended. And so if nobody rocks the boat, we have unity, the status quo. Those people don't understand that status quo is the Latin phrase that means the mess we're in. Uh, uh, unity in Christ is always going to be accompanied by change and growth and progress and multiplication and e evangelism, and it's always going to be a dynamic thing. The, the ecumenical movement seeks a, a kind of unity that is a pseudo-unity. Theirs is based on sweeping aside all the boundaries of doctrine and ultimately creating a worldwide church by means of compromise and then imposing an organizational structure over all churches. That one's going to finally have its heyday uh, right after the rapture of the church. But it, now it just has its seedlings sprouting around the world. 
The charismatic movement seeks unity, but it's not unity based on truth. It's unity based on having the same experience or the same set of experiences. And again, doctrine is largely swept aside. Various parachurch movements seek unity uh, based on focusing on specific individual goals and avoiding the, the tough issue, issues and focusing only on the things that they want to accomplish. Now, there may be unity in such movements, but it's an unrealistic in, in unity because it doesn't uh, encompass the entirety of the body of Christ. I came to the Lord just before I went into college, and I remember being in a you know, college group at church and Bible studies in college, and I thought, oh, this, this Christian unity, this is wonderful, <laughs> and it was easy to have. We all had the same interests. We were all within three years of each other's age. We all had the same worldview. We didn't, frankly, give a rip about the 78-year-old that had just gone into the hospital for the final time. You understand? There, you can't just be say, claim your unity when it's so limited. True unity comes only when God's people are grounded in truth and walking by the Spirit. Any unity that requires you to set aside certain truth is pseudo-unity. It's something less or something other than biblical unity. Uh, about the time I was invited to start teaching things in Russia, uh, another organization invited me to go and do a very similar thing, go and teach for several weeks in, a, in, in another country, and they wanted me to, uh, to teach some, some doctrines. And then uh, um, th they let me know, when it comes to baptism, you must give equal treatment and totally balanced treatment to all the different views of baptism. When it comes to the end times, you have to give equal treatment, equal validity to all of them. So in other words, I said, you want me to go teach that God said, when it comes to the end times, my view is blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter. You can, you can contradict your brother in Christ and you can both be totally right. That's not unity. Unity starts with truth based in Christ and then it's worked out in practice. Now, I just gave you the outline of the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters are doctrine, truth. The next three are very much a matter of our practice in Christ. Now, for chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we're going to see the worthy walk of oneness. Now, it's almost Scott Basolo-esque to make it sound that good, but it's not three W's. It's just a homophone that sounds like three W's, but it fits. The command is in verse 1, walk worthy. That's all the farther we're going to get today. And then I, I, I had to think of this the week before I have knee surgery, right? After walk worthy, keep the proper gait. I am so looking forward to walking with a normal gait. Amen, Dave? Uh, it, it, it's going to feel so good. Well, that's how we walk in unity. With all humility, all gentleness, patience, tol tolerance, and diligence. We'll get to that in, in due time when we come back to our next visit to Ephesians chapter 4. So walk worthy. Chapter, one, chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore... I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now, talk about a significant therefore. What did he say just before this? Remember the end of the previous chapter? Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, don't disconnect this. This is, the, this is how tightly the first half of this book and the second half is tied. Chapters 1 through 3 is all about who we are in Christ. Remember, there was only, I think, one or two commands in the first three chapters, and the main one was, remember 
Now we're going to get an avalanche of commands as we build through chapters, especially 5 and and 6. If you want to make a comparison, the therefore in Ephesians 4.1 is a lot like the therefore in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 1 through 11 is the loftiest, lengthiest piece of doctrine in the whole Bible. And then chapter 12 starts out with, therefore, my beloved brethren, in light of the mercies of God, here's what you need to do. Ephesians 4, 1 is exactly like that. So he says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, and literally that's the prisoner in the Lord. Paul's a prisoner But he belongs to the Lord, and the reason he's in prison is all about his ministry. So this is God's will for his life. If you remember what he already said in chapter 3, he began that chapter with, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I I am fine with being in prison because it is for the sake of the ministry that God has given to me. And then as he started to pray for them in verse 13, Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. This is for the betterment of the body of Christ that he is in jail. And as a matter of fact, around that same time, he wrote to a different church. These words in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Now I want you to know, brethren that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known through the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. How else would you evangelize a bunch of Roman soldiers better than making them guard Paul. That, that's basically what he's saying there. Now back to Ephesians. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, now here comes the command, implore, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. We don't use the word implore uh, very often. Um, the older English translation of King James says beseech. Uh, still others say urge. That's the command here, and then he's going to tell us what he's urging us to do. Um, And an interesting thing you can do in Greek that you can't do in English is give emphasis by the order in which you state words. Our uh, spoken language, our written language, depends on a basic word order, Uh, subject, verb, direct object, indirect object. That's the basic sentence structure that we have. Greek does the same thing. That's the normal way to do it. Uh, Koine Greek, biblical Greek, does that same thing. But there, the meaning of the words does not depend on their order in the sentence. It depends upon the form of the word, the, the form of a verb, the case of a noun, and, the, and the, um, the way that they are to be understood together. And the way to give a word the most emphasis is to move it from the middle or the end of the sentence to the beginning. The first word in Ephesians 4, 1 in Greek is implore. I implore, the, the, the pronoun is, is included in the verb. So he's putting the strongest emphasis on this. This is what the second half of Ephesians is all about. I've told you what Christ has done. I've told you who we are in Him. I've told you this grand plan of Jew and Gentile together in Christ. I've prayed that God would get the glory in all of these things. Now, implore I you. And then three chapters of what He is going to implore us to do. And we'll see the first part of it today. The word translated implore is a a pretty common Greek word. It actually has quite a range of meaning depending upon its context. Uh, It literally means to call alongside. You may have heard the word, parakaleo. It has the implication of calling on, entreating, admonishing, exhorting, or even comforting. The basic idea is bringing someone alongside someone else to give help or to give guidance 
words or to give comfort or to give instruction. And the meaning ranges from the most gentle, um, encouraging, comforting, soothing kind of words to the most powerful of commands. And this would be in the more powerful form of it. Interesting, the noun form of this word, maybe you've heard somebody use the word paraclete. Uh, parakaleo is the verb. Parakletos is the noun. The noun form of this word is the word used for the Holy Spirit. In John 14, it's usually translated as a comforter. Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter just like me. Over in uh, 1 John chapter 2, it's translated advocate, as in your attorney for the defense that comes alongside. Uh, when, uh, if you sin, we have a, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, from the very beginning and from the definition of the word, and you'll see it all the way through here, this unity is produced by the Holy Spirit. God is one. He puts His Spirit in all of His people. His people, therefore, are one. So he says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk. Now, there's the, there's the command, walk. Put one foot in front of the other. It's a vivid rather common metaphor in the New Testament. It means to conduct yourself in a certain way. When I say walk, it means, well, you got to be standing up, and then you put one foot in front of another, and you move in a certain direction. That's what walking is. Uh, how, how fun is it to watch a toddler when they first start to walk? You know, and they stand there and they weave around and then they realize that, oh, oh I just took two steps and I let go of the sofa. I think now I'll plop on my backside. And then they get up and they go at it again. You have to learn to walk. Well, that's why it's such a good metaphor for being a believer in Christ. You, you come into this as a, as a babe in Christ, says uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You have to learn how to walk. Now, how does He want you to walk? Well, there are a lot of ways this is used. Um, I actually did this. You can check uh, the occurrences of the word walk in the New Testament, and it's a great thing to do. You can develop an excellent theology of what the Christian life should look like in practice just by taking a concordance or using your computer and studying the word walk. Here's just some of the examples. Don't walk in darkness. Walk in the light. Walk in newness of life. Don't walk after the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Don't walk in craftiness. Walk by faith. Walk worthy. Walk in love. Walk circumspectly. Walk in wisdom. Walk honestly. Don't walk disorderly. Walk in truth. Walk in God's commandments. So pick where you're going to go. Pick up one foot and put it in front of the other and keep moving in that direction. Now, he says, I want you to walk, and he's going to tell you how, in a manner worthy. Those four words, in a manner worthy, is uh, the four-word English translation of one Greek word. It's the little adverb that means worthily. The, the root of the word means, uh, it comes from a word that means weight. And to be worthy in this sense means to have the same weight as another thing. Your Christian walk should have the same weight as your Christian doctrine, your, your Christian position in Christ. Think of an old time scale. You put a weight on one side, you put a piece of meat on the other to find out when they balance, you know how much the meat weighs and how much you're going to have to pay for it. So we are to balance everything that we know. What's that? Well, in this context, everything in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. You have to give just as much weight to how you live in the name of Christ as what you know about being in Christ. So it means to live up to who you are by God's grace. 
It means to practice what you say you believe. It means that whatever you know about God's Word, you are required by God to balance that with living in light of what it means. Now, let's go further. I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of what? The calling with which you have been called. The word calling means the, the divine call, the, the, God's summons to salvation, which God gives to a sinner. Now, I want to digress for just a moment to help you understand this biblical concept because there are two legitimate ways in which a calling is used in the Bible. Number one is the universal call to salvation. It, it, it's a universal invitation. Jesus said it this way in Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Read on in the context. You'll see he means rest for your souls. Get off the treadmill and rest in me. So it's a universal invitation. In our daily studies through the Gospel of John, it was only a couple of weeks back, we were in John chapter 6, and we saw this in John 6, 35. Jesus said to them at the feast, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. You might call it the he who invitation. Whoever comes, anyone can come. Anyone can eat of this bread. Anyone can have this eternal life. All are invited to salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance and a and a knowledge of uh, the grace of God. Now, that's the universal call to salvation. There are no limits to that. But the Bible also teaches that not everyone will come because how many respond to the invitation? Well, if you go read Romans chapter 3, how many righteous are there? zero. How many seek God? None. There's none righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks after God. That's one of the reasons why this idiocy of the last 40 years of the seeker-sensitive movement, we're going to design church for all of those people who are seeking God, means we're trying to we're trying to please unbelievers. No one seeks God. And you say, well, hold on, hold, hold on there. Wait a minute. You've heard my testimony. I, I, I started being convicted of my sin, and I, had this, and I had this hunger, and I sought God. Yes, you did. Why? Because God sought you. That We saw it in chapter 1 of Ephesians, the doctrine of election, that God chose certain ones to save them, that is the only explanation why anyone is ever in heaven because in our sin, we don't choose God. We don't seek God. So, the invitation is universal. The response is among those that He calls in the second sense. We call this the effectual call. It's the term that theologians like to use that God actually calls a certain person. He, 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 he plucks you out of the fire, if you, if you will. And here's a key to understanding this. Every single time this word call, uh, parakaleo, is used in... I'm sorry, that's parakaleo, that's uh, implore, kaleo. Every time that word is used in the epistles, everything from... Uh, Romans through Jude, every time you see the word calling there, try this out, it refers to the effectual call that God actually draws a person to faith in Himself. He grants that person um, 
repentance. He, he calls that person from death to life like we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. And so, it's not a surprise, this call, according to Romans 11, is irrevocable. It is God's choice, according to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, I'm sorry, to, yeah, 1 Corinthians 1 and Ephesians 1. It is a call to salvation. It is uh, an upward call, according to Philippians 3. It's a holy calling, according to 1 Peter and 2 Timothy chapter 1. And it's a heavenly calling, among other things, in uh, uh, Hebrews Chapter, um, chapter 3. So, understand this is how God calls individuals to Himself. Uh, some people, if you, if you read in uh, certain literature, people will, call the, will, will describe this as the irresistible call. And it's very unfortunate that they use that language. What they mean is it's effectual. It gets the work done of bringing a person uh, to Christ. But when we say irresistible, some people say, well, wait a minute, you're teaching that I don't have any choice. You know, it just, God, just, God just zaps you to faith. Well, I know the testimonies of a whole lot of people in this room, including me, and I have never, ever heard one that said, well, I didn't want to believe, but God made me no, 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 it's not, it, it's not like that. It's irresistible in the sense that there is one woman that I met in my life that I found irresistible. And she didn't overrule my will. Well, there was that time last week, but you know, that's, no. You get the point? That kind of irresistible, it is effectual. What is the resolution of the mystery between the fact that you are 100% responsible for every decision you make and God is 100% responsible for every decision you make? Leave it to God. Both of those are absolutely true. But now look back again where we are. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now, Remember I said, test this out, always in the epistles, this is the meaning of it, the calling with which you have been called. That's very important terminology. Have been called is an aorist passive verb. The significance of aorist means it, it looks to a point in time. There was the time at which you changed direction. The passive form means it happened to you. God called you. Very significant. It's not talking about walking in a manner in order to become worthy to be called. It means you have been called, and now that you've accepted the call, you need to live in such a way that gives equal weight to your position in Christ and your living according to who He is. You need to live up to who you are. This is why doctrine always has to come before exhortation. How can you possibly live up to what you don't know? How can you use resources that you don't understand? Again, if you'll let me make a comparison between Ephesians and Romans, you might think the same guy wrote them both the way he structured them. Um, Romans 11, uh, 1 through 11, and therefore do this. And then you get to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. You do this by the transformation of your mind, the renewing of your mind. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Fill your mind with the first 11 chapters, and now time to, time to put on your big boy pants, grow up, and live the way you're supposed to. Same thing with Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, and then chapters 4 through 6. And this is a very important issue, and it's where a lot of Christian teaching goes wrong. A lot of people like to teach the shoulds and the oughts and the shouts without teaching who you are in Christ. And that's always 
problematical because people get frustrated trying to live up to something, but they don't know what it is that they need to live up to or how to live up to it. If you exhort without building people up, it's, it's deadly. It produces Christians who are like children who've been yelled at but never instructed. And you've seen kids like that. You might have grown up in a situation like that. You know how horribly frustrating that is. Trying to make application without doctrinal foundation does several destructive things. For one, it produces guilt-ridden, ineffective, ignorant Christians, or worse yet, people who've been told they're Christians when they really don't even know the gospel. They can't produce spiritually because they have no concept of their resources and they're spiritually malnourished. It, there are some absolutely heartbreaking statistics these days of surveys among evangelicals. The root of the word evangelical is evangel, euangelion, the good news, the gospel. A, a, an evangelical should be a person who knows, loves, lives by, and preaches the gospel. And the vast majority of people who are fine with wearing the label evangelical, you ask them what the gospel is and they can't explain it. What is the gospel? Well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus because Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. And, and you can't be a Christian without believing that. So if you have a bunch of people that say, I'm a gospel kind of person and I don't really know what the gospel is, what do you have? You have a beautiful product of the work of Satan, the ultimate counterfeiter, the ultimate deceiver. And if you try to make application without uh, foundation, it can also cause people to become very experience-oriented and subjective instead of you know, Scripture-oriented and objective. You know, you, you can be faithful to truth. You can stand on the truth, but not. it doesn't work that way with experiences. You're going to see in Ephesians, this, Ephesians 4 through 6, this, this, this twofold truth. He's going to tell you, walk, keep this way, keep walking this way, always walk this way. And you're going to get to chapter 6, and he's going to say, stand. Well, Paul, what do you want? You want me to stand or you want me to walk? Come on, get with it here. Well, when you're being assaulted, stand your ground. Stand in the truth. And if you're not being assaulted or even in the midst of the assault, walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And if people decide that their standing in Christ is based upon their experiences, oh, are they going to be confused. And I think the, the Greek word for that kind of life is yo-yo, uh, up and down and up and down. Seeking application without doctrinal foundation just makes fertile ground for all kinds of things to go wrong. Legalism is one of them. Legalism is where you haven't taught people who they are in Christ and the riches of salvation and, and all that we have and the security that we have in Christ and the finished work of Christ. And so you, you try to make person behave like a Christian. So you say, well, he, he, here are the rules. And always when you start doing that, you get rules that go beyond what the Scriptures say. And you rob people of the ability to think things through. They just say, okay, tell me what to think about this. You can't add or subtract from God's Word. And legalism is a result of not teaching people who they are in Christ. You teach them that they need to act like this in order to try to be good enough for God to like them. It's always deadly. It leads to speculation. Because if people don't know the depths of what God's Word says, they will speculate about it. They'll, they'll well, this, this sounds right to me. Always a, a, a bad thing to do. I always say when we do our question and answer series, our, I call it provoke the pastor, and, and I get questions that sometimes that, well, um, 
why did Jesus say this? Or what was Elijah thinking? Or something like that. If, if the text of the Bible says, well, then we'll find it. But for a, a true Christian, sometimes the answer is, the Bible doesn't say. And that is a perfect answer. Are you willing to believe that God has given to us everything we need for life and godliness, or are you going to speculate about things? People start speculating, a new denomination is born, a new cult is born, a new book is written, uh, all sorts of things fall apart. And that ultimately leads to heresy, which is just speculation run wild. Remember Paul told Timothy, I left you in Ephesus in order to teach certain men not to teach strange doctrine. That's 1 Timothy 1.3. Look what he said right after that in 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. For some men straying from these things, these specific things about what it means to be in Christ, some people, uh, some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. That's just all false teaching is. Let's think up something and saddle up our horse and ride off into problem land. I've spent many sad hours, I've had many heartaches trying to help people overcome the, the results of stupid spiritual advice that has been given by people who haven't spent the effort to search out what does God say on this subject? What is the biblical definition of human? What does it mean to be in the image of God? And then we build from there. Uh, the, the point of all this is that our unity cannot be displayed until we start with an understanding of who we are in Christ. And we have a commitment to accurately apply that truth that God has revealed to us in His Word. In other words, as we walk along, the unity becomes evident. Unity is rooted in knowing your, oh, here it is again, your calling, the calling with which you have been called. Unity is part of our calling. Unity is not an option. It's a reality. And by the way, Jesus prayed about this unity and for you and me when it comes to this reality. Remember the night before He went to the cross and the great prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? Among that, these verses starting at John 17, verse 20, Jesus says to the Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. The antecedent of these is the 11 remaining disciples, because Judas had already done his evil deed and departed. I do not on be ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. He goes on to say, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Now, here's the important thing to understand. Jesus' prayer was answered as soon as there were two, well, there was 11 that night, as soon as there were more than one believer in Christ, they are one, they are one unit, they are one body together. We are one in Christ. There's only one body of Christ. We here in this place, we are one local manifestation of that body. Take a look at what's coming up after we 
finish this sentence that we began today. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and see if you can figure out if there's a theme here. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called, back to Ephesians 1, you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You might say you are all one. We are a unit. My friends, our job as brothers and sisters in Christ is not to create unity. That's because we can't. It's God's work. Our job is to live out the unity that is created by God through Jesus Christ and to avoid messing it up. And that's where the hard work needs to be done. That's where it matters so much how we walk, how we practice our lives together. Here's a spoiler alert. Next time we visit Ephesians, I think we're going to make it all the way to verse 3 and look at the, the last participle that dangles from the command, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. It's this, Ephesians 4, 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We don't create it. We work hard to preserve it. And the word translated Diligence has to do with your first and highest priority. What is it? Hang on to what God has created in Christ. Here's another way to look at it. Romans chapter 12. Oh yeah, Romans chapter 12 is kind of parallel to Ephesians chapter 4, isn't it? Romans 12, 4 through 6. For just as we have many members in one body, there he's describing your physical body, all of the different parts of your physical body, just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. My friends, we belong to each other. We need to function in harmony with each other. This is the unity that God has created in Christ Jesus. So, we need to walk in a manner worthy, granting sufficient weight to who we are in Christ. So, as I say, you can not Practice Christianity apart from a church. You can't do it because we belong to each other. We are incomplete without each other. That's why I say when you are physically reduced to having to watch what's going on here by way of live stream, Oh, how we miss you. I'm so glad we can get this little bit of connection, but we have to practice it together. We have to be committed to it. Our highest priority, our our most conspicuous diligence to belong to each other in Christ. And I promise you, I and everyone else who has ever preached a message like this wishes we had a, a button on the pulpit where we could make all of the empty seats hear what the people in the full seats are hearing. We need to we need to disciple each other. We need to encourage each other. I implore you, well that's the word come alongside. We need to come alongside each other. I made the comment as we were, we've been down a little bit for a few weeks because of the, 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 the COVID numbers and all that. And I said, oh, okay, you're missing somebody? Give them a call. Send them a text. Write them an email. Do so, reach out and get a hold of them. You that are on live stream, you don't see who's here. Check out. Call. Check on somebody. 
See, and you know what? Some people actually did that. And you know what they said? Wow, I'm glad I did that. Or somebody said, I, I, I just got this call. How wonderful. That's because we are one body. And I implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. Now let's ask our Father to help us in our walk, shall we? Our Father, how we thank You for this, oh, this effectual call. Thank You for this thing that You have made us part of, this body. Have Your way, Father, with us. It's easy for us to become lazy. It's easy for us to become selfish. And it's easy for us to just forget what we are in Christ. So, Father, give us the, the desire to daily walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And then we look forward to what you will do through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.